All right, for everyone who's joining us, just give us a few more minutes and we will get started. Right, it is top of the hour. I know we still have people logging in, um, but we do have a lot of information to cover today. So we will just go ahead and get started. Please keep in mind that this webcast is not worth CPE credit. We are recording this and we will get it out to you as soon as we can after it is edited. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and use the Q&A box located on the menu bar or you can use the chat feature. It is preferred that you use the Q&A box so we can keep track of everything. Just in case we don't have time to answer all your questions, we can answer them offline. All right, we're gonna go ahead and turn this over to all of our presenters today and get started. So Art, if you would like to kick us off, we will get going. Amy, thank you so much and, and welcome ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking to you today during this very challenging time uh, in, in dentistry and in our American life. Uh, and I want to let you know um, that uh, we, my name, first of all, my name is Art Wiederman. Uh, I'm a, a CPA and a partner at the CPA firm of HMWC CPAs and Business Advisors. Uh, my office is located in Tustin, California, uh, in Orange County, about 15 minutes from Disneyland. And um, uh, I have been a dental specific CPA for uh, September will be 36 years. And I've been through all the ups and downs of our economy. I've been through the, uh, I, I've been through the Ebola crisis. I've been through the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the 2008 downturn. Uh, this, is, uh, this is new uncharted territory. And today we are gonna give you a really great 35,000 foot view of, of what we think that you should be doing to get through this crisis. We are all here for you. And, and I will tell you, I've been talking to lots and lots of people in the dental profession, attorneys, bankers, consultants, everybody that works uh, as professionals serving the dental profession, and we are all pulling together, uh, as is today, uh, I'd Bailey and HMWC. Uh, before I get going, I do have three people I want to thank who, without their help, uh, this would not have been possible. Uh, Jessica Grobel, who is the uh, Director of Marketing for the Medical and Dental uh, Group at Ide Bailey, uh, helped put this together. She did an amazing job. Amy D. D. George, you uh, can see, and she's got a smile. She's kind of our, my quarterback today. And Rachel Mitchell is the one that put together the amazing PowerPoint in, uh, in a very short period of time that you're gonna be seeing today. So thank you to all of the Ide Bailey people. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we know that you are nervous. We know that you're anxious. There's no sugarcoating what's going on. Uh, we're about two and a half weeks into not being in dental offices, and there has been a lot of information uh, that has come down. And I do want to let you know that that uh, the folks from HMWC as, a, as well as Ide Bailey on the, um, are here to help you. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, HMWC CPAs, uh, we have our dental division. Uh, we work with about 250 to 300 dentists. Um, we will be merging our firm uh, in about six weeks with Ide Bailey. And for the HMWC folks, Ide Bailey is an absolutely amazing CPA firm. Um, they are located primarily in the Western United States in the Midwest, uh, and they are going to be able to provide uh, us with amazing resources to help our dentists that we've never had access to before. Um, one of our presenters today, Mel Schwarz, is actually uh, in Washington, and he's on top of legislative affairs. Uh, I didn't have that when I was on, on my own or with HMWC. So, uh, uh, I Bailey, the folks there, I am so excited about our, um, our merging with them. 
Uh, I also want to speak on behalf of my partners, uh, my dear friends, Pam Chamberlain and Don Watson, uh, and our tax manager, Sam William, who handle our clients in Tustin. Uh, they're three of the finest human beings I've ever met and worked with. And the four of us are here to help you as, um, as is Scott Haberman and his team at Ide Bailey. So we are here to help you, ladies and gentlemen. And I just have one thing to say before we get started and we introduce everyone. Um, my late father uh, gave me a saying that I use in my life all the time, which is if you put your mind to it, you can do anything in this life. And this is the time that we as CPAs, dentists, business owners, need to step up to the plate and be leaders because we are going to get through this. There is an end to this. Remember folks, this is not an economic problem, although it has turned into one. This is a public health problem. And as soon as this pandemic wears down and we start going back to work and they ultimately find um, uh, an injection or some or pill or something for this COVID-19 virus, things will start getting back to normal. There is gonna be another side and we have to come out successful. So my five words for this whole thing, ladies and gentlemen, is failure is not an option. With that, let's introduce our panelists today. You've already met me, I'm Art Wiederman. Um, let me start off by introducing, um, I'm gonna just mention their names and then I'm gonna to go to each of them to make an opening statement. Um, we've got Dan Bywater, who is the Vice President of Ready Capital. He is an SBA expert and has lots of experience talking to you about um, the, the loans and the two loan programs that we're gonna be spending a lot of time on today. Uh, we have uh, two uh, great members of the Ide Bailey team. As I mentioned earlier, Mel Schwartz, CPA, who is uh, the firm's Director of Legislative Affairs. So he's in Washington a lot and uh, finding out what kind of tax law uh, is upcoming and, and, and keeping all of the firm's clients abreast of that. Scott Haberman is a senior tax manager at Ide Bailey, and he is, uh, I think Scott told me about 80 to 90% of his practice uh, represents dentists like what uh, Art, uh, Art, I'm Art, what I, uh, I do as well as Pam, Don, and Sam in our office. And we are honored, honored, and thrilled to have Megan Mortimer, who is the congressional lobbyist for the American Dental Association. Uh, we've been talking to Megan now for about a week, week and a half, and she's got some really fantastic information. So I'm going to start off by um, letting, uh, letting Dan, Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, uh, and you'll have lots of opportunity to give information today. Dan? Is, is your mic muted, Dan? I'm unmuted now. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, Dan Bywater. I'm with Ready Capital Corporation. We're a preferred lender with the SBA. Um, we, uh, we are, uh, me and my colleagues started up our group, especially finance group within Ready Capital about 10 years ago with another bank where we specialize in just dental, um, dental loans, medical loans, more of the professional industries, veterinarians. Um, I've been in the SBA for about 20 years now. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're on the forefront along with, um, you know, Art and Scott and, and, uh, and Mel, and obviously Megan, um, on, on, on this issue of what's going on. Uh, all of us were blindsided a few weeks ago. This is uh, something that um, the SBA um, and other banks have been trying to um, pivot, you know, through this, this problem and figure out how we're going to deal with this. So we feel like we're, we're getting closer to understanding how we can work through this, this issue. So I look forward to for this this uh, this webinar with you guys. Okay, thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. Dan has been amazingly helpful. He helped us put together a list of things needed uh, for the this PPP loan, which we're going to have uh, up for you, I believe. Um, next, let me introduce Mel Schwartz, who is the Director of Legislative Affairs at Ide Bailey. Mel, uh, Mel is a CPA. Tell us about yourself. Well, thank you, Art. <clears throat> I am uh, one of the two Ide Bailey people east of the Mississippi River, uh, as uh, Art pointed out, where our geography primarily lies. Uh, I have been in Washington now for 35 years, uh, following the tax 
uh, events, including six years that I spent up on Capitol Hill with the Joint Committee on Taxation. Uh, looking forward to more opportunities to work with the uh, the industry, and uh, certainly to uh, to deal with the legislation that we've already gotten, and probably more legislation to come. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, Art, and glad to be a part of the program. Wait a minute, Mel. You promised me that after this CARES Act, there's going to be no more tax changes, so I don't have to learn anything new. Is that? Oh no, 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 no. Never, no more tax changes. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, um, let me introduce Scott Haberman. Scott's a CPA, MPACC, MST. Scott, you got a lot of numbers, uh, letters in front of your name. I got a lot um, of education. A lot of education, there you go. Uh, Scott is a professional student. No, he's not, not really. Scott's <laughs> a senior tax manager and is in charge of a large uh, book of, uh, of dental clients. So Scott, uh, it's your turn. Thanks, Art, appreciate the time. Uh, so, I've uh, spent a good portion of my career serving professional service organizations, uh, particularly healthcare uh, clients, and like Art, well, maybe not as many years, but I was around during the Great Recession, and um, this is eerily uh, similar, but still different than that time. Um, so we serve uh, at I Bailey uh, dentists across the country. Anything from uh, sole practitioners to large group dental practices and DSOs. So we try to we try to fill the needs of doing everything except seeing the patient. So HR questions. We have HR group cost segregation studies. We have cost segregation specialists. So we try to try to fill the needs of a lot of our clients and and take care of them as best we can. Well, Scott, you mentioned that you're not quite as old as me, but one of the advantages of being older, Scott, is, you, is now that I've turned 60, I get the senior discount at the movie theaters without even asking for it. So there are advantages to being a little older. Um, the last, uh, the la last but certainly not least, is Megan Mortimer. Megan is the congressional lobbyist for the American Dental Association. And I would like to tell all of you on the, on the call that you, you don't see what your American Dental Association group is doing for you. Megan um, and her whole team of people in Washington have been working um, uh, tirelessly, working uh, with, with Congress, working with the Treasury, working, talking to SBA, doing everything that they possibly can, ladies and gentlemen, to, to, to benefit and help the dental profession. So I, I am... We, you should be all very much ingratiated for what the ADA is doing in this very difficult time. I mean, Megan has just given us some amazing information. So Megan, I'd like you to take several minutes and kind of talk about what you do and also what you're seeing. Tell us what you're seeing uh, in Washington and the dental profession, because you've got your eyes and ears on all of this. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction about what the ADA is doing, because we do want our members to know that we are working as hard and as long hours as we can in order to try to address this for the profession and for their patients and their employees right now. Um, I am um, part of a very small team of government relations professionals. Um, we have four congressional lobbyists and three lobbyists that specialize in the agencies, but we do a lot of crossover, especially right now. There is no lobbying Congress and then not also lobbying the agencies because implementation of these laws that have now been enacted is as important as the drafting of them themselves. So the ADA, our government relations team specifically, has been working in the last couple of weeks on nothing but COVID-19 and how we're going to be able to assist our members in making those correct business choices based on what's been enacted into law. Um, as you know, in about mid-May, or mid-March, excuse me, they um, passed the um, first kind of families first coronavirus that had a lot of um, things in it that were most beneficial to our members. It was the second package, but the one that had the biggest first swath of things that we were paying attention to and looking for implementation. And then this past week, at the end of last week, I can't believe it's only been four days, um, we enacted into law the CARES Act, which as we know here, has a lot of information on the SBA loan programs, and what our members can be doing now to either apply for those or look into applying for those. So we have been furiously, um, before implementation and before the, the laws were enacted, especially CARES and the Family First, we were also lobbying to ensure that small dental practices and, and larger dental practices were not left out. 
sometimes legislators inadvertently leave out certain professions or write the law in a way in which it would make it not accessible for our members and, and dentists. And so we were working around the clock even before these laws were enacted to ensure that dentists were considered healthcare providers, are, are seen as an important figures in this crisis, and that they are getting all the benefits that they would receive if they were you know, the other rank and file physician. So that's one of the things that we made sure were gonna happen. And it doesn't stop now. Just because CARES Act passed doesn't mean that there's not gonna be more legislative opportunities. We feel there's another package coming down the pike soon, and we've already developed a strategy and talking points for what we wanna to go to the Hill and agencies to lobby on behalf of the profession to push forward in the next package. Um, we haven't made concrete decisions, but we know discussions about tax credit for PPEs for dental offices that are donating those supplies to the healthcare providers on the front lines. Clarification for some of the things that have already been enacted for CARES um, and the Families First. We'll definitely need to include some of those. Um, we're looking at how the long term in terms of maybe some Medicaid benefits for that patient population. And then we also want Congress and the rest of the world to help us to ensure that when patients are ready to come back to the dental offices, that they feel comfortable doing so, that we are seen as an essential you know, primary health care component for those patients. Oral health is always something that sometimes people want to push to the back burner, and we want to ensure for the long term that once the professions and once, once we're ready to be open for business again, people come back in, they feel comfortable, and they know that it's an essential and, and you know, very key part of their health. So I'm going to kind of stop there. Um, if anyone has specific questions for me on the congressional process or agency process, that's what I'm here for. But I can also jump in wherever needed, Art, on other questions. Megan, I want to add, before we go into the program, I want to ask you a question. Is there any, I mean, you are one person. You, you said you, there's, there's two, two of you at the ADA that does the lobbying, or is it just you? We have four congressional lobbyists yeah. and then three lobbyists that are dedicated to the agency. I, we all have different portfolios, right, so different issue areas. I do tax, small businesses, veterans affairs, higher education, student loan reform, and then some Medicare and Medicaid when I share it with my colleague. Um, we're all hands on deck on this though because there's a different, there's angles on every one of the different policy areas you can think of right now that are gonna be affected by the legislation that's been enacted into law and the ones that are coming down the pike. So, so my, my question for you, Megan, is for our listeners. Is there anything that an individual dentist, we have what, I think, what, 160,000 members, I believe? 163,000. Um, I am sorry. You know, I'm not very good with numbers. <laughs> I said that once at a lecture in front of a thousand people at CDA and a dentist stood up and said, wait a minute, you're a CPA. You're supposed to be good with numbers. I was kidding. <laughs> so for your 163,000 members, Megan, is there anything that they can do, writing congressmen, writing senators, anything that the dentist can do to help? Um, you know, push their cause? So yes, there's one thing that I will, if we can send it around to all the participants, we do have what we call our grassroots alerts. Um, it's an action center in which when we have asks of Congress or the agencies, we ask our dentists to go on there. We have it preloaded for you in terms of the narrative that you send to the Hill. You just click on a box and then it'll come from you, the dentist, to your congressional member and your district and your two senators. So anytime anyone wants to see opportunities for that, I will send it around to the group so that you can sign up so that you can be a dentist that receives the alert that we want you to send this grassroots narrative to the Hill. And then, um, you know, email me if you have specific things that, you know, you are, if you're a member dentist or you're a dentist in general, and you have specific asks uh, that you want of Congress, I can direct you to the office and get you in touch with the right person. Um, if I get hundreds of those requests, it'll take me a little bit of time to process, but we're always happy to put dentists directly in touch with staff and congressional members, and then we need them and implore them to participate in those grassroots alerts once we send those out. And there'll be more coming soon. Fantastic, Megan. Thank you so much. You've been so helpful to all of us in the dental profession. Um, okay, well, let's get to our presentation, ladies and gentlemen. I want to kind of give you um, an overview of our discussion topics today. Uh, the, the webinar is slated to be about an hour and a half. I suspect we might go over, don't know. Uh, it depends on how much I talk. So it could be we're here for five hours, probably not. But um, plan on an hour and a half. We go over a little bit, that'll be fine. Uh, we finished our opening comments. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of talk to you about a 35,000 foot view of what you should be doing today and how to plan. 
Um, everybody is thinking about all they're thinking about, all I'm hearing about, all of our questions are about, all right, how do I get these loans and what loans do I take and how do I do this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to take a breath, take a step back, and I'm going to give you some things that you need to do to get started. And I promise you, we're going to spend a lot of time on these loan programs. Once we figure out, we got to figure out how much money you need. Once we figure out how much you need, where do we get it? Okay, and then um, uh, Scott, Mel, and I are going to chat about the new tax laws and the unemployment relief. Uh, and then we're going to spend a good chunk of the time talking about uh, the two loan programs that everybody has been following, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or the EIDL loan, and the SBA 7A Payroll Protection Program loan, the PPP loans. And then we'll We'll, we'll, we'll hit a couple of questions, although I think we're going to cover most of your questions in the presentation. So, all right, Amy, if you can go to the next slide, please, that'd be great. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I, I use a term in my practice and in my life. Uh, it also applies to my golf game. Everything is a math problem. Everything in my life is a math problem. What we're talking to you about today is a math problem. So, um, you know, as dental consultants and coaches, we can go in and take a look at a situation and say, okay, your front office administrator uh, isn't really good about reappointing patients. Doctor, you're not doing a good job uh, in case presentation and creating urgency. And we can work with offices on that. I don't have a playbook for my business has stopped generating revenues, but I still have overhead. That would be like Tom Brady and Bill Belichick going into the Super Bowl without a playbook. Now, I know Tom Brady is now a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, but the analogy fits. He's been to the Super Bowl a bunch of times. So what I want to do with you in the first couple of minutes of this webinar is, is to implore you to, like I say, take a breath, and you need to make a 30, 60, and 90-day plan. In other words, uh, today is April Fool's Day. It's April 1st. Uh, we didn't plan the seminar intentionally to be on April Fool's Day, but it just happens to when it fell, and it's a great time with what's going on. So for the months of April, May, and June, we need to know how much money we need, okay? Because, you know, when you have your dental office, you're getting your revenues, insurance is paying, patients are paying, you're paying your bills, everything is great. But now my revenues are going to dry up very quickly. And I'm still going to have some fixed expenses that I have to pay. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet, but not yet. So what I want you to do is I want you to, you're going to use a spreadsheet that I'm going to go to in a minute. And the first thing I'm going to have you do is to, for three months, April, May, and June, calculate how much revenues you're going to get. Now, you should continue to get insurance payments from insurance companies. We haven't heard anything about insurance companies shutting off the spigots. In fact, um, uh, a couple of the insurance companies are actually trying to help the dentist. I'm not going to get into that today, but they're going to continue to pay dentists. That's very important. You are going to have some patients that are going to continue to pay you, probably few and far between. So we plan for the worst and hope for the best. Then we'll have to estimate your dental team costs, okay? Because that's the biggest cost in your, um, in your practice. Now, we are not, I want to be very clear about something. We do not have a labor attorney on this call today. So any labor law issues, any employment issues, please, please, Scott and Mel and I are very, very good competent CPAs, but we're not licensed attorneys. And we've gotten hundreds, maybe a thousand questions on labor law. If you have a question, should I, should I fire or terminate my employee? Should I furlough my employee? Should I do this or that with my employee? Please contact a labor law specialist and Scott and Mel and I have those people in place that we can refer you to. So depending on how, what you're doing with your team, most of the doctors I am seeing are basically have pretty much laid off their employees. And we're talking about unemployment a little bit later in this presentation. So you have to figure out how much you're paying them, okay? If you're paying full salary, that's one thing. If you're paying uh, nothing, that's another thing. Most of the offices who've laid their employees off, many of them are taking their uh, vacation and PTO and sick time, so it's a math problem. Then we estimate the other practice expense costs that you're going to have to pay, um, including loan payment deferrals, and we're going to talk about deferring payments. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, it's about 
keeping our cash flow down, and, and I'm gonna use this term several times in the next couple of minutes, we need to build a war chest, okay? We absolutely need to build a war chest of money to get through this because we are gonna come out on the other side. And if you run out of money, um, you're gonna have a big, a, a big issue. And I will tell you, I heard Treasury Chairman Mnuchin on Face the Nation Sunday morning, and he made it very clear that while, as Megan correctly indicated, there may very well be a fourth stimulus bill because the federal government is not going to let the United States fail. That is not going to happen. They will do whatever it takes. But, but while there's gonna be another stimulus bill, um, you know, we've still gotta pay our bills. So uh, we've got to estimate our expenses, defer payments, and, and just figure out how much money do we need and build a war chest of money. Folks, it's not like bananas or tomatoes. They don't go bad. The money doesn't go bad in your bank account. Um, and then you need to figure out how much to get by in the next 90 days. So um, Amy, if you would be so kind as to put the spreadsheet up. Great. So uh, if you could go ahead and scroll it up to the top. Okay, so Dr. Arthur Wiederman, uh, I have been, I get lots of mail as a dentist, by the way, over 36 years. So I made myself a dentist. And this is my 90 day cash flow projection. So I have a practice that does about 80,000 a month with 65% overhead. Uh, my accounts receivables are about $100,000. And uh, thirty thousand dollars of that is due from insurance companies, and the rest is due from patients. Again, I made this a very, very simple thirty-five thousand foot view type of an analysis. So I looked at my revenues. Well, in month one, I'm projecting that I'm going to get maybe twenty thousand dollars. Maybe I'll get a good chunk of that insurance money. In month two, I'll get ten thousand. Month three, I'll get ten thousand. Now, this is assuming that we are not open uh, April, May, and June. Now, folks. Everybody, no, nobody knows when we're going to be going back to work. Uh, President Trump has indicated that the government, the, uh, the country is pretty much going to be status quo until at least April 30th. You've been listening to him and the people that are talking. Um, we're going to have more uh, notifications of people who have this virus. And I don't think anybody's going back to work until May 1. And I, we may not be back to work at May 1. We don't know. So that's why 90 days for now is a good thing to do. Then you look at your expenses. Now, in this example, I put in that you're paying your employees, and that's $22,500 a month. I just estimated that. Again, this is about in the range of what we see. Um, if you're not paying your employees, um, then uh, you don't have to pay that. You may be paying $4,000 a month. Maybe you're employing them two hours a day. Uh, we've had some doctors that are paying employees two hours, four hours a day, and they're doing lots of training, which is a great thing to do if you choose to employ your employees and pay them, to have them working on systems and all the things that you never have time to do in the dental office. Then we look at payroll taxes. Payroll taxes are very simply a function of salaries. It's 8% of payroll. So we added that in. Uh, health insurance. One thing about health insurance, folks, do not stop paying health insurance. Talk to the labor attorney. But we are encouraging our doctors to continue health insurance because if you don't and someone gets sick and you bring them back, you might be liable for their medical bills. You have to be really, really careful because we don't know where this is going. Uh, you're not going to have lab bills um, after the first month. So 5000 for lab. Uh, you know, lab generally runs about 6% uh, of production. Dental supplies, 55 to 6.5% of production. Those are the standards in the industry. We won't, we won't have much lab or supplies in month two or three if we're not in the office. Rent, you must continue paying your rent. Um, we've had lots of conversation. We've had doctors on other webinars that I gave. I was on a webinar last Wednesday uh, that was hosted by Howard Ferran of Dental Town, and I was on a panel with... Uh, one of the head people from Ivoclar, as well as Dr. Gordon and Dr. Rella Christensen. And we were talking about this on that webcast. I was one of the presenters. And basically, your, le your, your lease agreement is a legally binding lease agreement. And it's very important that you follow it because if you stop making payments, your landlord down the road could say, hey, Dr. Smith, you know, you stopped making these payments 
and uh, under clause 7.A365 of your lease, I now have the right to recapture your space and I can kick you out and get someone to pay me double the rent. Now I realize folks that the government is putting laws in and the states and the counties are putting laws in that you can't evict people, but you don't wanna go down that road. What we're recommending our people to do, our dentists to do is call your landlord and ask your landlord, would you be willing landlord to defer my rent for three months and either add it to the end of the lease or amortize it over the rest of the lease. I actually had one of my 35 year clients who sold his practice two years ago. He called me yesterday and he said, Art, this is what I did. I called the, my, my tenant, the person I sold my practice to. And I basically offered this, this young woman who bought his practice, I offered her uh, half to, for her to pay half of her rent and to forgive half of it for three months. And, and I said, so what did she say? He said, she was in tears. Now, that is not going to happen on a regular basis with your landlords, but it could. You could have bought your practice from the, the, the man or woman who owned the building, and they could give you some forgiveness and say, listen, I understand what you're going through. My heart goes out to you. Sure, I'll do that. If you do get your landlord to agree to some sort of a deferment on rent, uh, get it in writing, get an attorney to draw an addendum to your lease, because if you just go verbally, that's not going to work. Uh, you're going to have marketing and website costs. You want to keep your website. Don't shut your website down. Folks, we need patients to know that if your state allows you and if you choose to uh, see emergencies, and again, this is all a very legal issue, follow the rules of your state dental board and the ADA and all this stuff. If you choose to see emergencies, you want patients to know that you're available to see emergencies. You wanna be communicating with your patients. People are talking about, again, doing this all legally. Uh, teledentistry is, is, is something that's come up. So you wanna keep your, your marketing and your website going because you are gonna come out of this on the other side. Um, I put down legal and accounting folks, um, and I am not, I promise you, I'm not being self-serving. We are all very, very blessed in our profession at iBailey and HMWC that, that, that we've been very, uh, very blessed to work with the dental profession, but this is the time when the, the, that we need to engage with you and help you get through this crisis. You've got your legal and your attorney and your accounting, office expense, repairs and maintenance, and then other office expenses. So this is kind of a very vanilla 35,000 foot view plan. Then you've got the doctor's benefits. Remember the doctor's benefits are gonna be things like auto. There's not gonna be much travel, we know that. CE, this might be a great time to do some online CE that you haven't had time to do doctors. There's a cost to that. And health insurance, you're gonna have your health insurance. And then loan payments, and we'll talk about that in a second. So in my example on the spreadsheet, ladies and gentlemen, the total expenses that we're gonna have for three months are gonna be about $135,000. We're gonna bring in 40,000. So the net loss, the deficit that I have to cover is $95,400. But wait, there's more. That doesn't include our personal expenses. Now, home mortgage payments. And again, I'm gonna to get to on the next slide when we go back to the PowerPoint, I'm gonna talk about loan payment deferrals and all the things that the, the dental lenders and the other lenders are doing. We'll get to that in a second. You've got home mortgage payments, car payments, food, um, you know, uh, insurances, your life and disability. You don't want to stop those and let those lapse. You absolutely don't want to do that. Uh, utilities don't go away and then miscellaneous living expenses. So maybe uh, Dr. Wiederman needs about $9,450 a month if the loan payments are, def are not deferred. Um, so I need 28,350. So if I add those two numbers together, for three months, I need $123,750 to pay everything I need to pay, okay? This doesn't include any unusual, out of the ordinary expenses. For example, ladies and gentlemen, and we're gonna talk about taxes in a minute, you are going to have to, if you have a balance due on your 2019 tax return, that's been deferred for three months, but you'll have to plan that. If you planned on a retirement plan contribution, uh, for 2019, a lot of our doctors, um, a lot of our doctors don't make their 2019 simple IRA profit sharing defined benefit contributions until after um, the beginning of 2020. You need to plan on that. 
and you don't, in some cases, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, you don't have to make your contribution uh, unless it's a safe harbor 401k, which it's pretty much obligated. But if you don't choose to make your 2019 contribution, um, you're going to have to pay some additional taxes. So all these things have to be factored in there. So in this example, I'm looking at 150 to 200 thousand dollars. Is that how much money you're looking at? I don't know. But this is the first step, ladies and gentlemen, that I believe that you need to take in order to figure out how much money you need to get through this. Okay, so now we know we need $150,000. Let's go back, uh, Amy, to the slide. And where do we get it? We want you to build this war chest. So the first thing you want to do, again, what did I say? My life is a math problem, right? First thing, start with your accounts and your practice. How much money do you have in your business checking and your business savings account? Maybe you've got 50,000. I, I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, and, and um, before this hit, before March 15th and March 16th hit, my dental practices, and I know I've talked to Pam Chamberlain, Don Watson, Sam William, our, our, our team in Tustin, um, our dentists were doing really, really well for the most part. I mean, the economy was great. We created 273,000 jobs in the month of February. That, that's a huge number of jobs. And obviously, it's gone the other way, but things were going well. So maybe some of you have developed, you know, accumulated some money. Look at your existing lines of credit. And um, I may ask uh, uh, Dan to jump in on this one. I'm telling, Dan, I'm telling people that maybe if they have a $100,000 business line of credit, we don't know where the banking system is gonna go. It might behoove them to maybe pull some of that money on the line of credit just to have it in their checking account in case they need it and the bank uh, calls them up one day and says, oh, sorry, gotta shut your line of credit off. Dan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, uh, I could see the logic in that, um, but I, what can this kind of goes in relation to the the loans out there the ppp loan and the idle loans they're not going to look at cash flow and, and the debts you have so if you were to draw on that it's not going to affect that that side of things but as far as what you're talking about are where what these guys decide to start pull, pull the, pulling these lines and shutting down these lines i think it depends on your prior relationship with your bank i think if you were doing really well beforehand they might be looking at you and saying you know what a couple months these guys are going to be back to where they were let's not pull the lines so there might not be a threat there but if um it can it can go either way um i could see the um i could see the logic in doing either okay oh, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt interrupt you dan no, no, no. That, that, that's that's about it. So I, I really, I guess, I don't have an opinion on that. I think it depends on if you think the, the you have a good relationship with the bank. Um, if you feel like you do and you've had a strong year, like most people have, I think you could probably just leave it alone. Um, but but if there is a worry there, it might make sense to pull it. Okay. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is um, you have the ability to do some retirement plan loans, and we have a slide on that coming down the road. Um, Congress and the CARES Act really beefed up your opportunity if you choose to, to borrow money from your retirement plan. Uh, and then finally, cash value of life insurance. If you have a cash value life insurance plan and you can't get any money anywhere else, um, do not just, by the way, don't cash in your life insurance policy because that could be, probably will be a taxable event. So what you want to do is call your insurance agent and say, uh, hey, Joe, hey, Susie, I've got, how much money do I have in cash value? How can I borrow this out? Because when you take a policy loan, it's not a taxable event generally. So that would be one thing to look at. And then obviously the last way, which we're going to spend the majority of the, the time on today is the government loan programs. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, I'm going to now engage um, Scott and uh, Mel, who are uh, my fellow CPAs on this call. And we're going to kind of start talking about the, the CARES Act. And, and there were some tax provisions that came into this that are very helpful. Now, we are not going to get into all the issues of who files for unemployment, how much is the unemployment to some extent. We're just going to basically give you some of the general rules. As part of the CARES Act, 
the the federal government is is is, is absolutely uh, bound and determined to put money into um, into their uh, in, into people's pockets, and they're going to do it in a couple of ways. Um, they're going to do it through the three hundred forty nine billion dollars through the loan programs, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But they're doing these two things first. So um, we have an income tax credit. Uh, we, we have a payment. And the payment is going to be coming from the federal government. So everybody is going to be receiving, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are going to be receiving checks. Many of the dentists on this call will not be receiving them. So what will happen is, is that, and, and Secretary uh, Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, said that these checks are going to start going out in somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three weeks. Um, $1,200 is going to go to every American if they are single and their adjusted gross income is under $75,000, they will get a check for $1,200. If they're a head of unmarried head of household, $112,000 is the AGI limit. And if their uh, adjusted gross income for a married couple filing a joint return uh, is $150,000. So the head of households and the single folks are going to get $1,200. Married filing joint, $2,400. And $500 for any child. Now, um, and again, Mel and Scott, jump in at any point if you want to comment on any of this stuff, feel free. Yeah, um, the child has to be a dependent under the age of 17. So those are the, the exclusions there. Right, and we know that all of our children are dependents until they're 90, but that's another conversation for another day. Uh, now, how are they going to figure this out? They're, the government is going to look at either your 2018 or 2019 tax return, whichever is filed. Okay, and in the long run, it really doesn't matter what was on your 2018 or 2019. Several years ago, when, when the um, Affordable Care Act came in, they set up a system where people were given advance credits to pay medical insurance. And, and this is kind of the same way. And, and the government would say, okay, how much money did you make? And we're going to give you this amount for medical insurance. And if you made a lot more money, you got to pay back the medical insurance. This is going to work the same way, folks. So the way this is going to work is the government's going to look at your 2018 and 2019 tax returns. Um, and they're going to look at your returns and they're going to basically see where you landed, whichever return is the latest that you filed. Uh, they're going to use the direct deposit and electronic the, uh, direct deposit information that you've recorded with the IRS. If you filed a paper return, the IRS is actually going to put up a treasury is going to put up a website for you to provide your information. Um, uh, let me let me let me stop for a second and also say that if you're AGI, this 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 phase is out for single people. Once you get to ninety eight thousand, there is no more uh, payment, and once you get to one hundred ninety eight thousand, there's no more payment for married filing joint. So what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to send you the check based on what they have, then this payment is actually based on what your 2020 adjusted gross income is going to be. Um, and, and once that happens, they're going to square up when you file your 2020 return sometime in 2021. Um, unemployment compensation. And this is going to be an interesting co conversation that, that we're all going to be having down the road, folks, is right now most states, most all states are allowing employees who have been laid off in the dental office to file for state unemployment. For example, in California, you can file for unemployment even though you have not been legally terminated if your office is closed um, and, and get between 40 and $450 a week in California unemployment. Every state is different. Um, what they've done with the CARES Act is they've added $600 a week of federal funding, which is gonna go to the states. So theoretically, if you have a, a, a person in a dental office and they're getting the maximum, call it $400 a week from the state, they will get $600 a week on top of that. So 1,000 a week, which is 4,000 a month. And the conversation we're gonna be having, and we're not gonna get into this debate today, is in, in many cases, um, you know, people might be making more money by staying home than by going back to work. And, and Congress looked at that and they passed the law the way this is. I believe, am I missing something, folks? I think that's what this is, right? Yeah, and it goes until end of July as well. Right. So this will run for four months. Yeah, so this runs for four months. We, we sure, sure hope that the offices are going to be open. So this is something that is going to help 
your employees. So if, if you do choose to have your employees not working for you, have them file for unemployment, uh, it sounds like they should be well taken care of, um, you know, go from there. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about some of these retirement uh, things, the retirement changes. Number one, for any of you on the call who are over uh, the age of 70 and a half, and they, they made changes back in December, they had what's called the SECURE Act, where they raised the required minimum distribution date from age 70 and a half to age 72. What they did for 2020 is they basically eliminated the requirement that you take a, a required minimum distribution for calendar 2020. If you've already taken a required minimum distribution for 2020, I believe, and Scott and, and, and Mel, correct me if I'm wrong, you do have 60 days to roll it back into the plan. I believe that's what this says. Now, the other thing that you could do, we talked about building your war chest. Say you don't qualify for any of these loans. Most of you will, but say you don't and you don't have any money and, and you've got to pay stuff. All of you under the old rules were able to borrow money from your retirement plan up to the lesser of $50,000 a year or half uh, $50,000 or half your vested interest in the plan. Um, they have raised it and you had to pay it back over five years with um, uh, at least quarterly. What they have done is they have number one, if you want to take money out of your retirement plan for this year, they've waived the 10% penalty for early withdrawal. Um, and you have to check your state like California, it's two and a half percent on top of that. I suspect that will be waived too. Now, you can now borrow up to the, the lesser of $100,000 or 100% 100 of your vested interest in your retirement plan uh, account. Uh, you can put it back into the plan anytime in the next three years, or if you keep it out, you can choose to pay the tax this year, or you can pay the tax over the next three years. So they've really given you some options. Now, something to think about. I've talked to investment people who say, well, you don't really want to borrow money out of your retirement plan because we're at the bottom of the market. And what if this thing, what if, if and when this thing turns around? These are all decisions you should be having with your investment advisors, but it's another source of money. Scott and uh, Mel, anything else on this topic? Yeah, my, my advice to my clients is this is really the cash source of last resort for your exact reasons right there. Are, you don't want to lock in your losses now and risk that. That's my, that's my guidance there. Absolutely. And I agree with that. This is, this is your last resort. So if you are a, a husband and wife uh, and you've both been putting money into your 401k and profit sharing plan for 10, 15 years, uh, I suspect that both of you would have this. So this is $200,000, but I think Scott is spot on that it's your last resort. You have this, uh, this as part of your war chest if you need it. Okay, Amy, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, one of the other really nice things that has been done in this CARES Act is that student loan payments have been deferred until September 30th. And these are uh, payments to the government. Uh, I mean, loans from the government. And also, um, you know, employer paid student loan payments are not going to be income up to the $5,250. But you, you want to make sure that you, you, you keep that in mind. That's another way to defer money that your student loan payments are going to be deferred. Okay, let's go to the Here, next slide. I might mention there, Art, that this is one, this is Mel, this is one where you do need to be careful and determine what your source of that loan is. Because yes. Sally Mae is not included in this, uh, this relief. This actually has to be a government-sponsored loan. So uh, just, to, just to beware and not count on that uh, if you have a private, uh, private source of the loan. That's right. Many people have that. Mel, that's a great point. Thank you for that. Uh, many people have refinanced their loans uh, with some of these loan refinance companies over the years. They may not qualify for this relief. I also want to say, sorry, one thing, Art, for the private Please. lenders, a lot of them are coming forward and doing at least some deferment or some payment deferment. The ADA also has a uh, exclusive contract with Laurel Road, which is the private loan servicer. And we have had conversations with Laurel Road and they're going to do some deferment and some, um, you know, not allowing you to accrue interest on your loans for a little bit. So there is some of the private lenders are stepping up and trying to do a little bit as well. 
Yeah, Megan, thank you so much for that. And, and, and there's just, there's just, just check with your lender and call them up and say, do I have an opportunity to defer my loan payment? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and Mark, Mark, I just want to jump ahead. in right there on that, sure. that previous slide. So the, the employers are allowed to uh, pay up to that, uh, essentially the education amount, the 5250 each year as a non-taxable uh, benefit for their employees. So that might uh, be a nice recruiting tool for associates or new employees that they're trying to attract once this uh, dust settles. Uh, you can pay uh, their loan payments on, on their behalf and that'd be non-taxable income to them up to that limit noted on your previous slide. So that's something to keep in mind. My favorite type of income is non-taxable income. Um, what, what was it Steve Martin said in his comedy act? He say, he say um, I had two words to the IRS. I forgot to pay my taxes. And he thought that would work. I don't know if it does, Scott, or not, but we could try that sometime, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> my futile attempt at accountant humor. There you go. So IRS and tax filing for 2019. So. What they did when they started this thing is, as everybody knows, your federal and state income tax returns are generally due on April 15th. It's been that way for the 44 years I've been doing tax returns. Um, so the government at first said, okay, we're going to allow you, if you owe money, to defer payments until July 15th. But you still have to file your taxes by April 15th. So what little hair I had on my head basically fell off. And the American, uh, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, uh, which is our lobbying group, they do what Megan does for the American Dental Association, went to Washington and said, hey, uh, Congress, um, how do you expect CPAs to file tax returns for people if we can't physically meet with them? Huh? <laughs> so they came to their senses. So now the federal tax filing deadline and most states have fallen in the line that you have until July 15th to file your federal income tax return. You also have, if you owe money up until July 15th to pay, if you do not pay by July 15th, you have, uh, you will incur penalties and interest and they might take your firstborn child too, which may or may not be a good thing or bad thing, but they will definitely charge you penalties and interest. Now, you can get a three-month extension in July to file your 2019 tax return until October 15th. But again, there's no extension to pay past July 15th. Now, if you, um, now here's your comic relief for the day. And uh, Mel and uh, uh, Scott, I went on the IRS's website for about a half an hour yesterday looking for any updates. And the last update on this was, was on March 21st. So here's your comic relief for April Fool's Day, ladies and gentlemen. So for those of you that are self-employed, that are not uh, corporations and your dental practices taking W-2 salary, if you're taking W-2 salary, uh, you're paying your taxes through withholding, just like your employees are. So this doesn't apply to you. But if you are either a sole proprietor, uh, um, an LLC, a single member LLC, multiple member LLC, um, a partnership, you're making quarterly estimated tax payments. And they're due in April, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. So now what the government said is, okay, your second quarterly, your, your first quarterly estimated payment is now due on July 15th. So everybody's thinking, well, what about your first, uh, what about your second payment? No, that's due June 15th. So as it sits right now, and I see Scott and Mel smiling, correct me if I'm wrong, the, first est the, the second estimated payment actually has to be made before the first one. Do, do I have that right? Yes, yes. you have that right. Uh, okay. However, I'm like, I would say- I'm like that, not making this up, I promise. No, you are not making this up. This is, uh, uh, this is the current situation based on, on what they have said. Uh, I would, however, note that we've sort of had a, a rolling process of delays come out of the IRS. And it would not be surprising to see this at least unified on a July 15 date. Uh, I believe this morning they delayed deposit of uh, alcohol and tobacco taxes. Uh, so maybe tomorrow will be our turn for this one. Uh, well, I, I can tell you after the last two weeks, 
my contribution to the alcohol tax may go up significantly. This is crazy. Okay, and then finally, if you're do a refund, file your tax returns because the government's not delaying that. They want to get you your money. And, and folks, if, you, if you're a client of, of HMWC or I Bailey, we're working on your tax returns. Um, you know, I want to bring you into the CPA world for a second, folks. Um, we got this extension. We had a little breathing room. And then all of this hit. And we're now helping all of our clients. We're taking, I mean, Scott, how many emails and texts and phone calls have you gotten from clients in the past week to 10 days? It's been, uh, it's been some long days, but I'm sure long days for our clients too. Right. And, and so, so while we're trying to help everybody with this and, and while everybody is working at home, so imagine, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're trying to do dentistry. Your high, I'll use Southern, I'll use Orange County. Your hygienist is in Tustin. Your, your front and back office people are in Mission Viejo and your dentist lives in Long Beach. <laughs> Try doing that. that we, we're, all, we're all working mobily. We're, we're making the best of it. So it, it's been a little crazy for the CPAs and everything. So, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of crazy. So those are the main tax um, issues that we deal with here. All right, let's go to the next slide and get into the real need of what right, we're let me, talking about. Let me jump in here. So, so even if you aren't going to receive a refund, uh, I've been encouraging clients, let's, let's get everything prepared as soon as possible so we know what the total bill will be uh, to the IRS and, your, and or your state uh, come July 15th. So you can start planning and projecting. So I've been highly encouraging, let's get the work done now. So either you get your refund ASAP or you can pinpoint what the potential liability will be three months from now. Perfect. Great advice, Scott. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this, and I'm pretty sure we're going to go over 90 minutes because we're already about an hour, and there's a lot. There's just so much to talk about, folks. Um, okay, so when this started on March 15th and March 16th, there was no PPP 7A loan, which everybody's been hearing about and talking about. We're going to spend time on that in a minute. So what we had was we had the EIDL loan, E-I-D-L, Economic Injury Disaster Loans. These loans have been around for a while. Uh, they were for you know, all the terrible hurricanes and earthquakes and all this kind of stuff. And before, starting on March 15th and 16th, we were encouraging our clients to apply for these loans. I actually did an application with a client while we were on a, a, a conference for two, it took two and a half hours to gather the information, upload it to the SBA's website, Sometimes you got confirmation, sometimes you didn't get confirmation. So what they did on Sunday night, about nine o'clock in the evening, or it might have been a little earlier of this past week, is the SBA realized that this was an archaic way to do this. So they revamped their website. Now, let me, and, and I'll get to that in a second, and the link is up there. And, and, and in our opinion, everybody should apply for this loan. And, and Dan, you can jump in, everybody can jump in when they want. So this is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which is a loan that needs to be used for business expenses, can be used for up to, can, they, they will loan up to, under this program, $2 million to, use, to cover business expenses. The interest rate is 3.75%. You have up to 30 years to repay the loan. There's no prepayment penalty and no fees. Because when you go for an SBA loan, and, and, and Scott and, and Mel and I know that, that very rarely, do we go to SBA to do the traditional dental borrowing to buy a practice, remodel an office? Not, and Dan, most of the dentists who are borrowing money using SBA, it's, it's generally only for real estate, right? Uh, not necessarily. There, there's some cases where you have someone that maybe that's buying a practice where they might not qualify right. for conventional right. financing. Maybe they have like a bankruptcy in the past or something that disqualifies sure. them for conventional lending. But, but the, that's the exception rather than the rule. And, and so we have that. Okay, so, so what they did is they came up with this new, um, basically this new procedure. And as you can see, it's uh, COVID, double backslash COVID relief .sba .gov, uh, forward slash hashtag forward slash. Um, so anyway, you go on there, you answer a bunch of questions. Um, you actually put your bank account information in, because I did this, uh, and it, it, you're done in 15 to 20 minutes. 
But here's the really cool thing about this. You don't necessarily have to take this loan if they offer it to you, but everybody who applies for the most part, and Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a grant of up, and it's not, everybody thinks it's $10,000. It's up to $10,000. That theoretically, we use the word theoretically a lot at HMWC and I Bailey, especially in the last two weeks. Theoretically, the government is supposed to put this money in your bank account within three days of the date that you apply for this loan. That's what the CARES Act says, I believe. Megan, am I correct? They're supposed to do that. Well, I applied on Sunday, and today is Wednesday. I haven't checked my bank account today, but I would not hold my breath. Good luck with that. But what we are encouraging our clients to do is to apply for this loan, whether you get it or not, whether you accept it. Because remember, if you're approved, Dan, if they're approved, they have to sign loan documents in order to get the loan, right? Exactly. You can be approved and not accepted. So it makes sense to just get in there, get a, get approved, get your application in, and then, then you can make a decision with your advisors whether you should take it or not. So this is $10,000 of tax-free. Let me, let me say that again, ladies and gentlemen. Tax-free. Uh, Mel and Scott, is tax-free good or bad? I think that's a decent option, I would say. Uh, okay, <laughs> now you're supposed to say it's good, it's good, it's good. Tax-free is good. All right, thank you, Mel. I appreciate that, all right. We've got our act together here. Okay, so one of the, I just saw the question checked up on the, on the chat. We are encouraging all of our clients, even if you have applied before the streamline process occurred, apply again. Is that what we're, Megan is shaking her head, yes, Megan? Yes? Yes, because SBA yeah. doesn't have any sort of um, procedure in place to give the grants to the people who applied before, and we're concerned that the pot of money for the grants will run out before they get their act together on that, so please just reapply. It only takes 20 minutes, and it's far less questions than, and documentation than you've ever had to do before, but just get in the queue, take mm -hmm. your 20 minutes, and reapply. Yeah, and, and, and basically, uh, it, it has a box. Make sure you check the box, and the box says, do you want the $10,000 grant? Check the box that you want the ten thousand dollar grants, please. Are, check real, real quick, if with everyone reapplying, I, I do want to caution, and this kind of leads into the PPP loan. You got to be very careful about what you're applying for. So, if you're going to use the idle loan for payroll, and you take the loan, then that will disqualify you from using being able to use the PPP loan. So. Again, you might you need to talk to an advisor and figure out exactly how you want to use this idle loan. If you're going to need the PPP loan, if you want to use the PPP loan um, before you start you know, accepting this money, because if you take it and you said you're using it for payroll, then you're done with the PPP loan. So we got to be careful. Right. With that. Okay, so let me. This is a great. Thank you. I couldn't have asked for a better segue. So th this is where we start having the conversation um, about the planning part of this. So I wanna be very clear. Remember I said take a breath at the beginning of this webinar? Okay, we don't know as, one of, as my dear friend and um, uh, client, uh, Dr. Phil Potter taught me the term, the rules of the knife fight. We don't know it yet. The SBA and the Treasury, I believe, are gonna come out with regulations. We don't know the rules yet, okay? We don't know how to roll the money over. We don't know this, we don't know that. But yes, um, Dan is absolutely right. Um, I mean, Dan, I've read things that say that if you get the idle loan, um, you can use that money before you use the PPP. We don't know this yet. So what's going to happen is, is you, you've got a, you, you've got um, I Bailey, you've got HMWC, you've got Megan and her team at the ADA who is staying on top of all of this. So we're not quite ready to say to you exactly what the strategy is. Megan, correct me if I'm wrong. But we're not quite ready yet because we don't have the SBA's guidance yet. Is, is that right? Yes. I mean, also individual practices and different practice models are going to mean, as you know, I mean, the equation is not going to be absolutely the same for everybody by any means. Um, right. So we do, I mean, again, just like, like Dan said, just apply for it, get your, check your box for the $10,000 grant. And then if you don't take the money, that's something that you can decide. But yes, do be careful about what you spend the idle on, just like Dan said, because you can't use it for the same purposes as the PPP. 
Okay, very good. All right, so let's, so, so the, the, the takeaway from the idle loan is apply for the loan, use the streamlined process. If you applied for the loan before last Sunday, which I believe was the 27th, um, uh, do it again, absolutely do it again. And by the way, you will get a 10 digit confirmation number that comes up once you've submitted the application. Write that number down, please, ladies and gentlemen. I, I did mine and we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, one of my good friends who's a CPA said, this may be the wild, wild west that we're getting into here. I mean, Megan, have you ever seen the federal government move this quickly? No, and they're gonna have a lot to answer for when they tell us they have to take six months to come up with rulemaking going forward. Oh my God. We can see that they can do it in 48 hours. It's insane. Well, and, and again, Mel, you're in Washington. Megan, you're in Washington. Uh, what nobody has talked about in the last two weeks because we've had this stuff to deal with, is that there's a, there's a general election. One third of the Senate, all of the House of Representatives, and the President is up for re-election. And I guarantee you what they're telling the people at SBA and Treasury is, you better get this right. Right? No yes, question. I'm sure. I mean, politically, it would not be good for anybody if this doesn't go well, at least as well as it can with this short amount of time and turnaround. OK, let's, let's move to the next slide. And let's get into the meat of this, and this is where hey, we're going to spend. Art, can I ask a question? You can. Did I, I haven't received any clarity. Yeah. I haven't received any clarity yet. So the amount of the loan for the idle program is that it says up to two million dollars. Um, I've heard it's a percentage of your annual operating cost. Dan, do you have any clarity or a ballpark of how much folks will be? awarded potentially for the idle loan just for their planning purposes well, I, I i will tell you that i heard one, i heard one story from one of my dear friends uh in our dental cpa group he told us a story of how a practice um had got 3.6 million that was doing 3.6 million dollars this is the story he told on on a, on a zoom meeting we had last week 3.6 million dollar practice applied for the loan right at the beginning, got a call from the SBA. SBA offered them a loan for $1.3 million. But if they took the $1.3 million, they would require more documentation. So if they didn't want to provide the documentation, Scott, the SBA told them, if I got this correct, we'll give you 500,000 today and no documentation. Would you like that? And they took it. This was the story that we were told if I got this right. and. Um, uh, and, and, and I don't know, Megan, if you were on that call or not, if you heard that story, but um, you might not have been on that call. But uh, I wasn't if, on that one. Yeah, we got, th that is the only thing I've heard. Other than that, I have no idea. There is no place to put in the, in the idle application, both the old one and the new streamlined one, to say how much money that you want and how much money you're applying for. You just send them the paperwork and they say, this is it. Now, um, before we get into the PPP loan, while I'm thinking of it, and Dan, this is where I'd like you to comment. I wanna, I wanna be very clear on something. Right now, before all of this happened, the banks were doing deferral programs. And by the way, I didn't touch on that. Let me touch on that real quick. You should be calling all of your lenders, all of the dental specific lenders are basically offering for the most part, deferrals of payments of anywhere between 60 and 120 days. If you haven't done that, you need to do that as soon as you get off this call. They will offer that. Many of them are saying, we'll just tack it to the end of the loan with no interest. We're seeing that with, with, with the major players in the dental market, okay? The other thing that we're seeing is that individual home mortgage lenders, the big banks, are offering to defer home mortgage payments. I would call every single lender, ladies and gentlemen, you have and say, listen, um, Mr. or Mrs. Bank, you might have heard that there's uh, nobody's working. So I would like to inquire into, can I defer payment on my car loan? Can I defer payment on my, call the credit card company. Some of the credit card companies are, are coming up with programs. It's all hands on deck. It takes a village and, and we want to defer all these payments. But the point I also want to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that, and, and Dan, Right now, all the banks are working on all of these deferments. They're working overtime on these deferments, right? 
Yeah, exactly right. Um, and that, that's kind of compounding the problem. Um, for instance, our bank, we have like 1,800 dental loans on book. Um, and we had within, I think a two week period of time, 600 deferral requests. And, they, and that, that's just the initial numbers. It's probably higher now. Um, so that, that's, that's taking time away from underwriters and uh, you know, as, they, as they do these deferment memos. Um, that's happening in every bank right now. So you have, there has to be a little bit of understanding about what the banks are going through um, as far as processing. So when this PPP program comes out, um, that's just gonna compound it even further. Um, luckily, it's a streamlined process. It seems like it's gonna be a very easy underwrite. Um, so hopefully it's going to be something that we can pump out pretty quickly. There might be some automation to it as well. And ju just to talk about the PPP program real quick, um, and uh, you know, anyone can chime in, obviously. But you have to realize this bill was passed Friday, um, and the, since Friday, the SBA has been going through the bill, coming up with policies and procedures and ways to process these loans. Um, and, and the banks are waiting on the SBA. So there's a lot of misinformation out there right now that, hey, my bank is saying that they're processing these loans or they're, they're taking applications. They can't process them yet. They, they can take applications, they can take uh, information, but then it's just gonna sit. Um, it's not being processed because the, the SBA hasn't come out with rules or procedures yet. Dan, I've heard the earliest that this could happen is Friday, April 3rd. Is that what you've heard? or is that, that That's what I've heard is Friday, April 3rd, that the SBA will come out with the information. But I do want to stress there's, a, there's this digestion, digestion period, right? So the bill came out, the SBA has been digesting it, coming out with their policies and procedures. And then once the SBA comes out with their policies and procedures, the banks are probably going to have to digest it to some extent for a few days. So we very well could be, a lot of banks could be taking applications a few days past when the SBA comes out with these policies. So there, there has to be some understanding there. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a bank taking applications and getting the necessary checklist items that the bank thinks they'll need to kind of get into the queue, kind of get into line um, for these loans. But we have to realize once the bank takes that information, don't expect it to be approved and get your money quick because it's, the SB still hasn't come out with how to process this. Yeah, and, and so, so what, what the message is, go ahead, Megan, I'm sorry. I was gonna say the one thing that did come out from Treasury yesterday, I'm sure you saw that, Dan, was um, a sample loan application for the 7A and then some very good, I think, pretty high level, but still good information for borrowers and lenders in terms of what the terms will be, et cetera. Uh, but Dan's totally right. The process still needs to be put in place by SBA and or Treasury. So um, we can send that also out around the, the, uh, the sample 7A application if people would think that would be helpful to just kind of prepare, but uh, we are still gonna have to make. Megan, we actually have it, and we're, Amy, we have those documents, which we'll put up in a minute. I want to I wanna go through the PPP program, and then when we're done going through the, the mechanics of it, the, the high-level view, we actually have the application that we can put up on the screen and that uh, document, right? Yes, Amy? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you so much. So let, let's go through the 35,000-foot what we have, and Amy, we also have the, the list of, of documents that we think might be needed. Do we have that also on, a, on an attachment or do we not? I have a PDF, um, a PowerPoint, and an Excel document. That's all I have. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll see what we have here. But, okay. Okay. So the Payroll Protection Program is under the Section 7A of the, um, uh, of the SBA rules. The 7A, there's two SBA programs, SBA 7A and SBA 504. So this has been added, this program has been added, Section 36 in the CARES Act to, the P, to, the, um, to Section 7A of the code. And what the intention is, ladies and gentlemen, is for you to keep your people employed. Okay, and the next slide, by the way, is going to be some of the planning questions that we don't have necessarily answers to, but let's see how this works. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to put together a bunch of information um, that, that I think we, again, I have to see, I, we'll see if we have that I thought we did, uh, a bunch of information. Um, and you're going to submit it to your bank and you're going to submit it with the loan application. We're going to get into that in a second too. 
you're going to apply through a preferred SBA lender. Now, uh, Scott, Mel, and, and Dan, and I think Dan, you and I talked about this on the phone yesterday. Our recommendation is start with your local bank. If you don't have a relationship with a local bank, I know Dan does these loans. Um, you know, th there, there's going to be lots of people that do them. But but is that Scott, Mel, Dan? I mean, a good place to start your local bank. Yeah, I've been encouraging my clients to talk to your current lender, ask if they're administering these loans. Uh, that's a good place to start since they have the relationship with you already. They know your story. I think that's a good place to start. But if they don't uh, administer these loans, I've been recommending a couple different uh, institutions. Yeah, and then and like, and like I say, Dan, Dan also, Dan, you also do this too, right? We lost Dan. He had to drop off and reconnect his computer. Oh, okay, so we'll get back to Dan in a minute. Okay, so let's go through the rules. Um, you're going to apply for this loan through SBA lenders. Um, so you're going to find someone. So you call your bank and say, uh, bank, are you a preferred SBA lender and are you participating in the 7A program? I guarantee you everybody who is a banker in America knows what this is. We've all been hearing about it and they're getting lots and lots of calls. Okay, so number one. Um, the loan period for the amount of the loan that is not forgiven. And the next slide is about forgiveness, which is what you all want to hear about. Anything that is not forgiven is payable. We thought it was going to be over 10 years, Megan, but yesterday on that sheet, it's payable, has to be paid back. That's not forgiven over two years at one half of 1% interest. When has anybody ever seen a loan at one half of 1% interest for anything? Never. Maybe treasury bills a while back or something. Now, so the first thing we have to figure out is how do we calculate the amount of money that the bank is going to lend you? And again, we have been mulling over all these and we don't have all the rules, but here's the basic 35,000 foot view. You're going to go ahead and figure out your payroll for two and a half, your, your payroll for the last 12 months from the date that you apply. Dan and Megan, correct me if I'm wrong. We're gonna look at your payroll. So you apply on April 1. So we're gonna look at your payroll from April 1 of 19 to 8, March 31 of 20. Dan, do I have that right? That's correct. Okay, we're gonna look at your payroll. Let's say your payroll is, um, I, I, I don't know if I have an example or not, but I'll, I'll have to look and see. We have, say your payroll is 50,000 a month. Now, what they count for payroll in figuring out what they're going to loan you is the following your actual payroll to your employees, vacation time, sick time, paid time off, the amount that you pay for your employees for health insurance, not the total amount, just the amount that you pay for them. If, the, if, if, they, if you're paying $200 a month for health insurance for your employees and they're paying the rest out of their paychecks, it's $200 a month. And the retirement plan costs. So if you have a simple IRA, it's the 3% match. If you have a safe harbor 401k plan, then it's 3% um, uh, or 4% or whatever your safe harbor match is. So whatever you're matching for your employees, that's what goes into this for the immediately preceding 12 months. Uh, we can also, we can also include and now, mind you, these are salaries that only count up to $100,000. So if you have an associate dentist that you're paying as a W-2 employee, that associate dentist is making $160,000. You can count up to $100,000. Uh, I believe we can also count the doctor's salary up to $100,000. Um, uh, there was a question, Megan, that, 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 that we were going back and forth, and I... I we were literally researching at seven o'clock this morning about whether independent contractor uh, income can go in. I think that's still a little unclear or did, uh, did we clear my that? Under my understanding is uh, the sub the, a 1099 employee, you can still count towards payroll, but yes. the reason why we also encourage the uh, 1099 independent employee to also seek their own 7A loans is that they may only be received, if, if they work for multiple practices, let's say, and only two of them participate in the PPP loan program, bring them back on and pay them, they're still out a lot of revenue from the other practices that are deciding not to do this. And for that lost income that the 1099 subcontractor won't receive from the practices that aren't doing this, they can also apply for their own 7A loan. Yeah, contractors, self-employed people, partnerships, all those 
types of people can, can apply for that. Now, so here's the, here's the takeaway, folks. What's gonna, what you're going to have to do in order to get this forgiven, all right? And we'll get to, we have a whole slide next on forgiveness. This money is intended to be used during the eight-week period from the date the loan is initiated. Now, Dan, we don't have absolute guidance, but do we think that there might be some flexibility? Say, say the loan is approved pretty quickly. Say that the loan money is available on April 20th but the doctors aren't going back to work yet. Do we have the ability to say, you as the bank to say, we're gonna hold this money and we're gonna give this money out May 20th when the dental office is open again. Have you heard anything on that or Megan? I, I've gotten a ton of questions about that, but I have, I have no direction from the SBA on that yet. Yeah, so, so the, the fact is, is that we need to get guidance. This is, the, this is a main takeaway, everybody, is that, we don't have all the rules. So you're asking, should I defer it? Should I wait to take it? Should I have them hold it? And there is a lot of misinformation out there about this. One thing while I'm thinking of this, there are gonna be, and I haven't seen them yet, but I guarantee you there's gonna be people that are gonna call you and say, you know what? Um, we can go ahead and, and, and help you with this loan and charge you an abhorred fee to do this. So be very careful of people scamming. Yeah, yeah, be careful that although although there is some um, rules in the in the act that state that you can't charge outside of the loan at all. Um, so if anyone does say that to you, like, look, hey, send me a five thousand dollar check as a deposit, I'll get this loan for you. Yeah, that, they can't do that. Yeah, and and there are rules in that which we're not going to get into. But I just want you to be careful that in every situation like this, there are the bad people out there who are going to try and take advantage of you. Just be very careful. So. Here's the thing that we have to know on the eight week period. So let's say that you decide to take the loan and with our guidance, you get the loan on May 1st. So eight weeks, not don't pin me down to days. Eight weeks is May 1st to June 30th, right? That's about eight weeks. So for that eight week period, as long as you use this money for payroll costs and the definition of payroll costs are the things that we talked about above payroll, vacation, sick time, PTO, health insurance, retirement plan benefits, and up to $100,000 per employee, including the doctor, right? We use it for payroll costs, rent. One point I wanna make, in the statute, it says, ladies and gentlemen, that it has to be under a rental agreement. So if you are a doctor who owns your own building and you don't have a rental building, a, a rental agreement with yourself, you need to get one the law says it has to be dated on or before February 15th is my understanding. So you gotta be real careful about that, folks, okay? So the proceeds have to be used in this eight week period for payroll costs, rent. Most utilities in, in the statute, utilities are generally gas, water, electric, telephone, internet. Uh, there might be one or two others in there that I don't remember. And then you're also allowed to pay interest on your prior existing loans as of Megan, I think it's February 15th. So. What we want you to do is, so let's take an example, doctors. You have my million dollar practice. My wage costs are $30,000 a month. Add the doctor's compensation, which is 8333 because we can go up to 100,000. Add the pension, let's just say it's $40,000 a month is the basis. We're gonna take that number, we're gonna multiply it by 2.5. That is $100,000, that's a very easy number for me to work with. So $100,000, that's the amount of your loan. As long as you use that money, $100,000 for, um, uh, for eight, in the eight week period for these covered costs, and as long as you meet two requirements for the payroll, one of which is you have to have the same number of full-time employees on June 30th as you had on February 15th. Stop me if I'm not getting this right, panel. And also, you have to have at least 75% of your payroll for this eight-week period compared to the prior calendar quarter, you have to pay at least 75%. So that's where we're at. Um, does that make sense? My, my screen is frozen. So I think I'm going to, oh, I don't think I'm going yeah, anymore. You want to be careful not to reduce any salary okay. during that time by more oh. than 25% because if you 
do, then that could affect your forgiveness level. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now, folks? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Well, um, I guess he can't okay. hear us. Okay. Can can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, you know what? Um, okay, Pam. I just got texted by Pam. She can hear me. Okay. So basically, <laughs> thank you, Pam. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, they can hear me. So um, now, if we go, so so this is what we need to do. We need to use the money for the eight week period. When eight week period start? Not sure yet. We still have to consider all of this. So on the application, on the application posted um, Mar uh, that was posted on the, the web March 30th of 2020 on treasury.gov, on the application, the borrower has to check a box stating that they understand that if they, if they use the funds for unauthorized purposes, unauthorized expenses that, quote, the federal government may pursue criminal fraud charges. Is that, is that everybody, did everybody see that on that form yesterday? I mean, that, that, that's, that's very serious. The government is giving money away, but they don't want to quite give the farm away. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. So th this, is the, this is the deal here, again, just for forgiveness. This is what you've all been waiting for. How, how do I get this money and not have to pay it back? It's, it's very important. So if the proceeds are used for the rent, uh, for the rent, the payroll costs, the utilities, and the interest, you can apply for forgiveness. So, so basically, in order to qualify the, for forgiveness, like I said, same number of employees on June 30th that they had on February 15th. And in addition, the payroll costs for the eight-week period have to be at least 75% what they were in the prior quarter. It's a complex calculation, folks. The bottom line is if you have the same dental team during the eight-week period you had before the pandemic and the salaries are the same, you're probably going to get most the maximum forgiveness. Anything that you're not forgiven on is going to be payable over two years at five-tenths of one percent of interest. So the way this is going to work, and, and Dan, you can jump in here too, is after the eight-week period is up, you're going to spend your money. And by the way, I'm recommending, and, and, and um, Scott and Mel jump in on this, that when you get whichever loan you get, or if you get both of them, that you should have separate bank accounts so that you, you don't commingle this money with all of your other money so we can make sure that you, we can really accurately track all of this. So you go ahead, you spend the money. Then you have an accounting. Then you go to the bank and say, bank, here's the deal. This is what I spent the money on. These are the covered expenses. Do the calculation. The bank's going to come back. Remember, we said we borrowed $100,000. Bank's going to come back and say, all right, we're going to forgive $92,736.28. And that's what's forgiven. And the other $7,000, $8,000 would be payable over two years at a half a percent interest. And that's how this is going to work. The SBA is required to issue regulations 30 days after the law became in effect as to how forgiveness is going to work. So folks, don't worry about the forgiveness at this moment. At this moment, let's get these loans. Let's see what we qualify to. Okay. There are going to be all kinds of technical calculations that we CPAs and financial advisors are going to have to make. And, and everybody's chiming in, a lot of misinformation, but this is the important thing. So let's go ahead and put up, uh, do you have the application uh, form, uh, Amy? Yes, I believe it's this PDF. Okay. So just real quick, I know we're two minutes to our end time. So if you guys do have to jump off, it is okay. We are recording this and we will email it out as soon as it is ready for you guys to watch. We will also email out all of the handouts that you've seen today. So, Okay, so this is, this is the actual document list that we're recommending that is a good place. And Dan, I'm going to have you comment on this. And by the way, we are going to, we're going to go for a little while longer, okay? So these are the documents that we're suggesting that you start getting together. So, and again, Scott, Mel, Dan, please all jump in as you need to. You want to get your, your 2019 four quarterly 941s, 944s, and your annual 
940, which is your unemployment form. You should have that. If not, if you are on a portal um, or you have access directly to your payroll service, you can get it there. They're not hard to get. You'll need payroll reports for the last 12 month period, ending on the most recent payroll. So you're gonna apply on April 3rd. My guess is most of you, maybe your last payroll is April 1st. Okay, and all those documents. You want 1099s for your independent contractors for 2019. Documentation showing what you paid in health insurance. That's in your general ledger. You can get that from your insurance agent. Uh, all the retirement fan plan funding uh, payments you made. And then we added a bunch of other things down here, Dan. You want to have ready, you think they're going to need tax returns for this? What do you think? Um, uh, the, I, to be honest, I, I'm kind of doubting we will. There's no, it sounds like there's going to be no calculations of cash flow that you typically get with a 7A loan. Um, but I would gather it just in case. So if it is asked for, you have it on hand. Um, I think the, the items above the also include um, section um, are probably things you, you'll want to get. But the other items, I, I'm not completely sure yet. A uh, copy of your dental license, your articles of incorporation in California for our California clients. Uh, you can get those for the most part right off the Secretary of State's website under the business entity search. Uh, uh, like say, uh, articles of incorporation bylaws, uh, your driver's license. I went to all the trouble to get that new special driver's license three hours at the DMV and then they put it off for a year. My luck, right? Uh, certification that all employees live in the United States because that's a requirement. And then probably your most recent 12 month profit and loss statement. Now, if you are having I Bailey or HMWC do them, we, we more than likely have them. Uh, if you are a doctor who has not sent your accounting work in for us to do financial statements, Scott, you don't have anybody who's not sent their stuff in, right? No, oh, everyone's done and filed. They're all taken care of. There you go. That's what I thought. Good job. Okay. Um, you need, we, we can't do accounting work for you if you don't send it. Many of you will be able to print out the QuickBooks. Dan, honestly, I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, we're, they're not going to be asking for audited financial statements uh, certified by a CPA. This is going to be a little wild, wild west here. Yeah, it, it is. I, I, like I said, it re remains to be seen exactly what the SBA is going to ask for. But I think I'm very certain that they're not going to be running cash flows and everything like that. They're going to be primarily looking at your payroll, what you spent, and uh, to come up with that loan number, and then really hand you the money, and then and then after eight weeks, see if you can qualify for forgiveness. Yep. Was well, better to ask for forgiveness than permission? Is that how it works in this life? There you go. Okay, let's go. Let's go to the actual uh, Amy. The actual. Hey, um, oh yes. I just wanted to do one one more thing in regards sure. to the forgiveness slide, and I didn't, I didn't see it in there, but I did see some information stating that. Obviously, this is mainly for payroll, but you can use it for leases. You can use it for utilities, different things like that. But I did see some information stating that you don't want to use more than 25% of your loan for those expenses. Because if you do, that could cause some of the loan not to be forgiven. So try yeah. to keep 25%, like below 25% for those other expenses other than payroll. And then we have our last, our last slide, which we're not to yet. So Amy, there, there should be an actual application on a PDF. The application- We are frozen on my end, so just bear with me for a second. Okay, Amy is frozen. All right. Um, so there's an application, it's a four page application. So while Amy's un unfreezing herself, uh, Dan, so the application that was put out on treasury.gov yesterday, um, you and I had a conversation and your comment to me was actually to say, that would be good practice for everybody to fill that out. Isn't that what you told me? Yeah, it would be. Um, I have heard that there's already other versions that are probably going to come out soon. Um, probably when the SBA comes out with their policies and procedures, but definitely fill out the one that's out there right now. I think that, I think some information was probably let out a little too early, to be honest. Um, yeah. but, but that application, it doesn't hurt to fill it out, get it ready to go and, and ready to submit um, with that other information that's on that checklist in the last slide. Uh, my only, my only, my only concern is is that if everybody fills out that form, 
Please don't be frustrated if your bank says, no, we don't want that form. We want the form that says Bank of Wiederman on it or something, you know? Exactly. There might be some tweaks they'll make to it. And yeah, don't be frustrated because this is all ad hoc. Everyone's on the fly right now. Um, but I think that's probably the gist of what the final applica application will look like. And you have to okay. remember this application is coming from the SBA, not from the bank. These are SBA generated documents. Right, and the SBA is going to give the banks the rules for, uh, so what exactly is the SBA? I mean, we don't know what the rules are gonna be, Dan, but what is the SBA gonna give the banks? They're gonna come out with policies and procedures on how to, uh, how to process these loans, you know, what to look at from an underwriting perspective, what to look at as far as processing, funding them. Um, that, that's uh, it's really just kind of like the owner's manual for, for something that you, uh, a product that you buy new. It's something that we need to read through to understand to see how we can work this machine and then go out and, and tell our clients, look, this is, this is what we need from you to, to start this up. Okay. So I, just to let you know, I'm seeing a bunch of questions come over in the chat and everything is what does the 75% mean? Does it mean this? Does it mean that? Once we get all the guidance as to exactly how some of these calculations need to be done, then we can advise people better. Is, is that right, Megan? I mean, we, we've got to wait for some more guidance. Yeah, I mean, I think we can say with confidence we can answer some of these questions, but I, I really do think we should wait for guidance, just like we saw yesterday when they updated the loan terms um, to reflect something that we weren't expecting. I just, I would say that, yes, we should wait before we start making declaratory statements on specifics. So, so thank, thank you. So, so here are some of the things we're going to be talking about, okay? Should you take out both loans? I think our advice on this panel is apply for both loans, right? Isn't that kind of the consensus? You apply for the EIDL loan, you're going to get up to $10,000. Apply for the PPP loan. That is money that can be, if you do this correctly, can be forgiven, okay? Should you roll? This is, we haven't talked about this yet. You will be able to roll if your EIDL loan, in fact, I think you're going to have to roll. Are you going to have to roll, Dan, your EIDL loan into the PPP loan? Um, that remains to be seen. If you, if you apply for both and, and, and execute on both of the loans, I, I don't know if there's a rule where you have to roll it into the PPP loan. Um, obviously, if you don't apply for the PPP loan, the, the EIDL loan will be on that 30-year term, 3.75% rate. So that, again, that's more information we're waiting on. Okay. When should you take out the PPP loan? Before or after you reopen your dental office? Not sure yet. We, we don't know what the rules are gonna be. Are, is the SBA gonna say to us, um, you know what, if you're approved, you have to take the proceeds on the date you're, you're approved, even though you're not gonna be open. Megan, I guess we don't know those answers yet. I mean, again, the letter, the intent of this legislation is to get people employed by June 30th. So, exactly. Even if you're not going to open your dental practice, they're the encouragement, they're incentivizing people to pay their employees, even if they're not coming into work. So, I, again, I would see guidance more so of just start paying people before June 30th, even if your practice isn't open, and that's how you're going to get your forgiveness. Yep, that, that's right. And what's the best way to recover my, my costs during this challenging time? Do I use loans? Do I use my savings? Uh, do I rob a bank? I mean, how does this work? What should I be doing here during this? No, don't rob a bank because uh, that, that's a federal offense and we don't want you going to prison. But I, I did make the comment in the next paragraph. Um, we are going to be on top of this, um, monitoring the situation. Um, I have another, we have another call at six o'clock tonight. We're waiting for the guidance, learning the rules of the road. Folks, patience is a virtue. We need to be patient. We absolutely need to be patient on this and everybody's going to get taken care of. For now, what we want you to do is to apply for the loans and let's see what the government rules are and how all this plays out over the next days and weeks and, and months. And, and, and that's kind of the, what we're thinking about. Um, most of the, so, so um, I think we covered, Amy, I think that's the last slide. It is. Yeah. Questions. So most of the questions that came over had to do with, should I take the, the EIDL or the PPP loan? So, you know, I mean, different thoughts of, of that we don't know yet, but, you know, the, the big question is going to be, what if people stay on unemployment till you open your dental office? Is that going to preclude you? 
Um, we don't know this yet. So there's a lot of things that we don't know. We don't want to, on this webinar, give you advice that basically says, um, this is what you should do now, because we don't have all the answers. So let, let's get this applied for, okay? Um, if, if, you, um, you know, if you owe your, ta uh, going back to taxes, if you owe taxes, plan on paying them by July 15th. Uh, if you have a pension contribution, plan on making it for 2019. Um, you, you can make it by July 15th or you can make it up until September 15th for defined benefit plans and, um, and corporations, October 15th for sole proprietors and partnerships for profit sharing, all defined benefits are September 15th. So for now, what we need to do is get your information together. Get ready to fill out the application. When your bank is ready, call your bank, say, you know, we need to know. Say to your banker, how do I know when you're ready? And are you gonna, they're all gonna, Don, Dan, isn't everybody gonna have this stuff online and ready to go when they're ready? Yeah, so I know for us, Ready Capital, we already have a landing page uh, to apply for these loans. And, and again, it's, it's, it's basically um, reserving your place in line. Um, where we'll reach out to you once the SBA gives us guidance and then we'll send out a needs list of what we need from you. I know other banks have been doing the same thing. Uh, there's some landing pages out there. Other banks just saying, hey, we'll, we'll email you back when we, when we open this up. So it kind of, it's, it's different with every bank. Okay, very, very good. Um, like I say, I don't want to get into all the weeds here of the questions because we, we don't want to give misinformation. Um, we just want you to make sure that you're in touch with your uh, HMWCI Bailey advisors. We're going to do our best to advise you. Uh, here's everybody's contact information. Um, and, and so, Amy, can I ask a question here? Um, so, so this is going to be up online. Is it going to be both on uh, HMWC and I Bailey's websites? Is that the plan? I believe that is the plan. And we think maybe by the end of today, tomorrow. We're aiming like for end of the day, but let's say tomorrow morning. <laughs> As you have to be patient with the CPAs and the bankers, you have to be patient with Amy. She's done a phenomenal job. Thank you so much. Uh, as well as Jessica and Rachel. My God, the PowerPoint was wonderful, thrown together in like re record time. You know, Dan is a resource. If you have questions, uh, Dan, make extra room on your cell phone. Um, you know, um, again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, Scott and Mel are resources for the firm. Uh, this firm, I Bailey has, uh, I, I've already worked with two of their specialists. So their, their knowledge of, of, of lots of area of the financial and tax law is beyond ridiculous. Uh, I now have somebody to play with, um, uh, lots of people to play with, uh, at I Bailey, very excited about affiliating with them. And now, one thing I want to announce is uh, now, I think we decided, Amy, that our next, we're going to be trying to do this. Um, we're going to have a, another webinar next Thursday. Um, Let's just that, say next week, and we will get everyone oh, the information. Okay, sorry. I thought we decided. No, it's okay. I, I, I'll talk to you after this about that. Amy, no, Amy, what you're supposed to say is, Art, be quiet. Okay. <laughs> Art, be quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. You got it. So I, I would, does anybody else have any comments they want to make about anything? I had just one, I don't want to confuse everybody, but there's two provisions in the CARES Act, uh, payroll tax deferral for 2020 yeah. Yeah. and an employee retention tax credit for 2020 that you can't capture those two benefits if you take out money under the PPP Correct. loan program. So just be aware that if you're getting funding for those, and I've, I haven't proofed it out, but I've heard that uh, more often than not, the PPP loan program will be better than both of those two combined. Uh, but that's something you need to be aware of and talk to your CPA about. Absolutely. So, and again, ladies and gentlemen, be, be patient with us. Everybody is calling the, the, our phones and I mean, I've been talking to Don and Pam and Sam and their, their, their emails are blowing up, their texts are blowing up, that everything is blowing up, their phone calls. We are doing the absolute best we can and trying to get tax returns done by July 15th. Um, this is a priority to all of us. Um, the last thing I wanna say is God bless you in the dental profession. You are wonderful, wonderful, caring people. 
I'm so blessed to have spent my professional career working with the dentists of America, Southern California. Uh, I'm blessed to have had my, my, my partners, Don and Pam, and my manager, Sam, working with me, their family to me, they're fabulous. Uh, the people at I Bailey have been fabulous. Megan, God bless you for what you're doing for dentists and what the ADA is doing for dentists. Um, everybody has pulled together to help the dental profession. We are going to do, and I'm going to I'm going to close the meeting with this. I have a very good friend who's a, a nationally known dental consultant. His name is Gary Takis. Many of you know him. Gary talks about legacy. And our legacy here at, at HMWC, Ide Bailey, and in the dental profession, and Megan, and all the people at ADA, this is a legacy moment. If we, we will come through this with flying colors, we will come through this strong. There's going to be pain, there's no doubt, but we are going to come through this and help you. But this is, I mean, I'm 60 years old, ladies and gentlemen. This is my legacy to the dental profession that if I can do something to help some of you, then, then I've met my legacy. And I think that's the way this is for everybody else on this call. We all deeply care about you. We're going to do everything we can. Be patient, take a breath, and we will all get through this. Thank you all very much for attending our webinar. It, it's been an honor and a privilege to, to host it along with my wonderful guests, Mel, Megan, uh, Scott, and Dan. Thank you so much. Great contributions. And watch your emails for the next webinar. Also watch HMWC's website. Also at, watch um, uh, I Bailey's website. I also, and I will mention this only once, I promise, uh, I do a weekly podcast called The Art of Dental Finance and Management. Uh, you can get that through the internet on your iPhones. Uh, we've done this for about a year and three months. Got a lot of great information. I'm trying to keep everybody abreast. The problem is when I record the podcast, what happens is, is the information is old three days afterwards. So, but it's still good information. Uh, again, thank you everybody on the panel. Thank you for our wonderful clients and friends in the dental profession. And God bless you. Please stay safe. Uh, that's the most important thing. Keep your family safe. And um, thank you for attending and, and have a wonderful day.